Welcome to the Loma Linda University Church Sabbath School. We've got another great study. And before we get started, let's start with a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I once again want to thank you for your word and the opportunity to study. Just guide our conversation and may all of those participating with us today be blessed. And we thank you so much in hearing our prayer in your precious name. Amen. Amen. And before we get into the study, like we like to do each and every week, here's a great mission story. Take a look. I'm Lee Rice, leader of discipleship ministries for the South Pacific. I'm in Port Moresby today and excited to be with Pastor Kobe Tao, leader of the church in this city of 800,000 people. Discovery Bible reading is at the heart of our disciple making process. Members invite family, friends, work colleagues, fellow students to come together to read the Bible. We asked Peter Runfeld to come and do some training for us. Peter has taught us the method of Jesus, which is simple, anybody can do it, it's reproducible at no cost. We decided to restructure the way we do ministry at our churches. And uh, we followed the model in the Book of Acts, uh, how the New Testament church grew. We turn our Sabbath school classes into discovery Bible reading groups. We've restructured our church Sabbath school classes according to the place where the members are living. We bring the church to the houses and the houses become church. My name is Nathan. I got excited uh, seeing the method in which we can share God's word to others. And I heard of that idea and I decided that I had to bring that idea to my home. Now this is where we meet every Sabbath. When we started this discovery of Bible reading with my family and my neighbors, it really had a big impact on our spiritual life. My family and uh, my kids, uh, all the three teenagers, uh, were able to discuss the Bible for themselves and we were having fun with it. Starting with the Gospel of Mark, read one story at a time, commencing with the prayer, obviously. Second person reads it, and then one person in the group retells the story in their own words. The process is built around five simple questions. What is new? What surprises? What don't you understand? What will you obey or apply to your life? And what will you share with someone else this week? After the discussion, we pray. Father, thank you for being with us. Please help us as we follow Jesus this week. I work for a large construction company as a building supervisor. After running that group in my home, I decided to bring that idea to my workplace. It had a very big impact on uh, my boys. I know an old blind man called Binige. I found out he lived in a makeshift sort of house. I had this idea of building a house. I went and discussed that with my boys. They got excited and they voluntarily uh, put their hand up to help me. I believe Jesus. My Savior, I trust in Him. One day He return, I go with Him. Every Sabbath there is two, three baptisms in each churches. 
by way of record this quarter, this has been the biggest baptism ever taken place in Central Public Conference. I am seeing a paradigm shift in the way we do church because the church is now seeing that we have to bring the church to where the community is. God uses ordinary people to carry out his extraordinary plan. That was a perfect representation of age-old principles of being applied in our current context. And I find that refreshing. I find it refreshing that when we go to Scripture, we can have something that is relevant for the situations that we inhabit today. Now, I'm going to start uh, our time together by asking for some help. You see, I am dealing with a crisis at home. No, Linda's fine, and Micah keeps being precocious and asking questions. But the crisis has to do with my three-year-old, my baby Kai. You see, he's entered into a stage, and I had somehow forgotten this. I had blissfully erased it from my memory. That stage when the boy will look at you, and his eyes will grow big, and he will yearningly ask the question, why? And you answer that question immediately, and that question is then followed by another question, why? And then you answer that question, and you have this litany of questions that continue to be asked until you forget and you why you begin to engage in this conversation, and then ultimately you give up. Questioning is an important part in development. A neuroscientist, Catherine Long, descri describes that as she began to study how children learn, she discovered something quite amazing. At birth, a child's brain has over a hundred million neurons. Each of these neurons contain about 15,000 synapses, the way in which information is relayed in the brain. These synapses and neurons working in unison in order to uncover this new reality, this world that has become and been open to the child. As the infant grows, it's interesting to note that at a mere six months old, he can understand his own language, and then the differentiation between the caregiver's native tongue and other tongues becomes clear and evident at eight months. In a very real way, as parents, we are engaging in writing the language for our children. As a family psychologist noted, we actually become the voices that guide our kids' inner dialogue. And as we deal with education, it seems to me that it's important to remember our responsibility as we minister and try to parent kids that need to continue having their horizons expanded. At a, at a mere four months old, a child, will, a child will understand that if you let something go, it will fall. At five months, they'll understand that just because something is not visible doesn't mean it doesn't exist or it ceases to exist once you remove it from sight. At eight months, like we said, language and patterns become clear in their minds. And at a mere 12 months, easy problem-solving skills begin to appear. By 18 months, you have a rudimentary understanding of both language. And at three years old? Well, at three years, you have these, grapple, these infants grappling with the ideas of biology and physics and God. And it is our voices, our ideas, our understandings that guide how our kids will relate to these concepts. One of my favorite writers, the great New Old Testament theologian Walter Brueggemann, defines education in the following way. 
He says, perhaps the primary issue in education, as it pertains to the Bible, is to break the grip on church ed education, which tends to be privalistic, idealistic, and spiritual. The crucial question before us is whether we shall have men and women in public life who have a passion for justice and perspective of mystery, awe, and amazing. Brugman is saying that as we begin as caregivers to relate and engage in dialogues with our kids, as we ask that endless list of questions why, we ought to do so having in mind people that will have a passion for justice, a perspective of mystery, and awe and amazement. So today's lesson deals with this idea, the idea of education and the law. Now, in order to understand this concept, I could take you to several places in Scripture, several pericopes and passages that talk ab about the relationship that exists between the law and education. We could certainly go to Paul, who talks about the law as a headmaster, somebody that can guide and correct him. We could also go to the same wealth of wisdom, that treasure trove of interesting ideas called the Pauline epistles and begin to muse about the concept of the law as a mirror in which we can see ourselves, a formula by which we can understand what sin is. But I don't want to do that today. Catherine Long's words about synapses and neurons and creating and coding the language, the inner voices that are, that will guide my children's inner dialogue continues to stir in my mind and weigh heavy on my heart. And because of that, I'd like to deconstruct the idea of education and the law a bit. And I'd like to do so by going to the book of Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. Deuteronomy 6 contains probably one of the most famous verses and passages in the Hebrew Bible. It is a section that is intended to answer a series of questions that young Israelite boys would ask. Questions that would guide conversation that young Israelite girls would have with their parents. Questions that mirror that litany of queries that my child asks me. Questions that have to do with what does it mean to be Israel and why do we do the things we do. The passage I want to focus on is called the Shema. It's called that way because it begins with a command, the command to hear. Now, scholars will tell you that this idea, hear, O Israel, is a formula that would have been used in the ancient Near East in order to call people to communal worship. And so what is happening here as the Bible is attempting to answer those questions that will guide our inner dialogue to give us some laws and some frameworks by which we can understand education is this. We view the process of education itself as worship. Hear, O Israel, is how it begins. And now I'd like you to open your Bible with me as we ponder this passage in the book of Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. The fourth verse, Hear, O Israel, the Lord God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk down the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Now, the scholarly consensus is that the verses that are to follow contain a compilation of sermonic material from three primary sources. That material can be easily divided into three parts. The first one from verse 10 to verse 14, the second one from verse 50, from the second half of verse 15 all the way to verse 19, and the final one from verse 20 to 25. But the preamble, what sets forth the table, is this idea of the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord God, the Lord Yahweh is one. 
Now, I want to resist the temptation to engage in a diatribe that points to the realities and the benefits of strict Judeo-Christian monotheism, for I think that we mostly would agree on that. Instead, I want to explore with you certain concepts that pertain to education, particularly as it is understood around the broader umbrella of the law. So what is Israel being called to do? Well, my friend, as we have just said, Israel is being invited to worship. It is being invited to worship the God who is one. Now, if you are to develop a curriculum of education, I would venture to say that we ought to begin by recognizing the oneness of God. The reality that, as we have said in, on countless times, God is holy other. But this holy other being engages in the most grace-filled act known to humankind, namely the business of creation. A study came out a few years ago that asked the question about Americans, how long do you just stop and look at the sky? Four out of five Americans said that rarely, rarely do they turn their lists, their eyes up to the heavens and think about creation. Think about this act by which the one God decides to open a space for something that is not God to exist. The Bible is clear. The heavens declare the majesty of God. The first step then in developing an educational curriculum is to recognize, to recognize as a law the reality of the Creator. And look at the suns. Look at the stars, as diverse as the hundred million neurons that populate a child's brain, you have a countless constellation. Think about Jupiter, that gargantuan planet that's 1,300 times bigger than Earth, with a diameter 11 times the size of our planet. Think about the reality of it serving as a shield for our solar system, diverting hits of debris that threaten our existence. Think about how its planetary gravitational force pulls in objects and matter that threatens our solar system. To be sure, creation is a cathedral. And as a cathedral, it is the first place in which we build an educational system. We look up and we realize the Lord God is one. But that's not all. That's not all that the author of Deuteronomy wants us to do. He doesn't merely want us to look at the heavens and the stars and recognize that God is holy other. He wants us to do more. He wants us to love. Love your God with all your heart and your soul and with all your strength. What is the response to this God who opens a space in creation? Well, it is the forming of a relationship. And like every other relationship, this relationship functions under a set of rules. And the rule is simple. The rule is to love. Now, loving God constitutes a risk. By God putting and placing that notion of loving him with everything we are, of looking at the stars and seeing how minute we are, of giving our honor and our glory, our faith, and our fortunes to him who made us. By placing that in there, God recognizes that it is possible for free sentient beings to decide to love something else. Let's face it. We are masters of finding other things to love. We love wealth and position, prestige, our careers, our callings. We love our ways of looking at the world. We love the ways in which we understand 
the universe to function. We look at the stars, and instead of recognizing the God who is wholly other, we, like Nebuchadnezzar, say, isn't this Babylon which I have created? Oh, God runs a risk when he creates. But because God is motivated by the law of love, God makes us free and sentient to respond responsibly. You see, education is nothing more than the older generation passing its passions down to younger people, hoping desperately that the younger people will respond with discipline and respect to these passions. And passion requires perspective. We need to have a laser focus on these things that we care of and that we care about. Oh, God's passion is his creation. His perspective is grace. Why? Because he is moved by the laws of love. And if we are to form wise inner voices for our children, if we are called to serve as, sage that we're, as sages that will guide their inner dialogues, then maybe, just maybe, we ought to begin to institute alongside the law of gravity and thermodynamics, the idea of the law of love and mutuality. You will love the Lord your God with everything you are, mind, body, and soul, calls to recognize the holistic nature of any enterprise that human beings are called to explore. What does it mean to be Israel? The young boy would ask. And the answer would come, what it means to be Israel is to recognize God's passion and perspective and to make those passions and perspectives our own. To look up to the heaven and recognize that we are created beings. And why do we do the things we do? The young girl would ask. And again, her parents would respond. A glimmer in their eyes. We do what we do because we function under the law of love. Anything else? Anything else that we construct? is a direct reaction to the problem of loving other things. In the beginning, oh, in the beginning when we loved God solely, there was only need for one rule. Don't eat of the, th of the tree. But when we began to love knowledge more than God, when we began to love ourselves more than God, a list of rules began to appear in order to gently prod us and move us back, back to that understanding that the author of Deuteronomy knows so well, Hear, O Israel, the Lord God created you and calls you to love him. Now the question begins and becomes, how do we react as we understand that we love God? How do, how do we move driven by this law of love? Well, notice, he says, these commandments that I give to you are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit down and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hand. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames of your houses and on your gates. How do you live life in accordance to the law of love? Well, you become intentional about sharing that. And how did the old Israelites do that? Well, they did so by an educational process. And what was part of these processes? Well, a couple things. The idea of active meditation, to think purposefully on the things that God has called us to do. I mentioned before that at age three, children will already have at least a primitive concept of who God is. That concept will, be, will become enlarged and will shift and sway as we get older. 
But as we seek to make that concept, these concepts and constructs that we create meld with a God who calls us to live according to the law of love, we must remember, we must remember that perspectives and passions that match God are only achievable if we meditate responsibly. In other words, we have to do good theology. And how do we good, do good theology? Well, we use love as our hermeneutic. That's our interpretive principle. It's not that difficult, but it's time consuming. You see, the author of Deuteronomy is saying, meditate on this day and night. And then he calls them to do two things, phylacteries and mezuzahs. Don't worry, I'll explain what those words mean. I was on a flight to Israel a few years ago, and as the El Al airplane was crossing over the Mediterranean, I saw him. He was a Orthodox Jew that was sitting next to him. We had had a lovely conversation on theology, on Sabbath, on what it meant to meditate on the Creator God, whose hermeneutic is the law of love, and then I saw him pull it out, the phylacteries. He put it on his head and then wrapped it around his forearm as he began to pray. After he was done, I asked why they did this. I knew he would point me back to Deuteronomy. But I didn't realize. I didn't realize that there was a deeper motif there. You see, when you meditate on the law of love, when you spend your time doing good theology, then that experience is lived out in the context of your everyday life. The things you think and the acts that your hands perform are reflective of a person who has recognized the Creator God, who has chosen to follow Him and live his life or her life by the law of love, and who now seeks to do good theology with that reality being his, his primary exegetical tool. You are to place these words on your forehead and on your hands, for they are to guide your thoughts and your actions. But you're also to place them on the mezuzah, on the doorpost. Now, often we can talk about archaeological discoveries that have seen that in the ancient Near East, you would place the name of your God outside of your door so that people would know. We can talk about the practical reality of our faith becoming apparent to everyone we encounter. But that's not what, Exod what Deuteronomy 6 is trying to tell us. You see, in Exodus... The word gate, the word doorpost is used. It's used at the, at the end of the covenantal part of the book. And it has to do with the relationship between a slave and a master. You see, when a Jewish slave decided to become bonded, bonded to his master or her master forever, they would go to the gate. And in the gate, at the doorpost, on that wood, he would place his ear, and then the ear would be pierced. And as that ear was pierced, this idea was birthed, the reality that the slave and the owner were now bonded together. The words on the mezuzah, at the doorpost of the home, are a representation that this home has decided to become the servant of the Yahweh who creates and who calls us to live through love. We are pressed into the service of a God who is always trying to surprise us. So let that be the inner voice and inner dialogue that your children hear. Combine your passion with, with a perspective. Teach them about the cathedral of creation. Allow them to grow up knowing the God who calls us to do good theology. You will meditate on these words and you will place them on your forearm and on your head and on your doorpost and on your gates. Now, the Hebrew word is interesting. It's interesting because 
it doesn't really say on your gates. The actual translation would be, and you will place it within your gates. This idea, the idea of Yahweh being one, functioning through the law of love, creating a cathedral in creation, pushing us and pulling us to understand things differently, calling us to become good theologians, to practice loving hermeneutics, all of that was to be placed within the gates of the community. On a stella, a pillar, a pyramid, right in at the heart of the city so that people would know, so that this idea would guide their every thought, their every action, so that this law would be understood. Why do we do what we do? What does it mean to be followers of this God? That's a discussion that you need to have with your children. I pray that it is a discussion that is driven by the recognition of the law of love. I pray that you recognize that everything that God is doing is being done to bring you back to him. And I pray that you, as you engage in conversations, you do good theology. And that this theology is driven by a desire to match God's perspective and passions with the realities that you inhabit. Stu, so let's talk about the law and love and education and this idea that keeps popping up in the Bible, both in Deuteronomy and in the Book of Romans. Well, I think the some people would almost feel like it's an oxymoron, law and love. You know, our, our experience, you know, if you get pulled over with a ticket or something, whereas you might realize it's supposed to be for the safety of everyone, you're probably not thinking love at those moments. And I, I think it kind of permeates, and I think there's many things that, that we we could really benefit from talking about. But let's start right right at the top. Law of love. One of the things that in these conversations that at least comes up to me often in, in conversations about this subject is kind of this tension about fearing God and a law of love. Fear God is the beginning of the wisdom. How do you harmonize those two concepts? The importance of fearing God, whatever that means, and a, a law of love. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I I think um, one of the first things that that we ought to recognize is that um, emotions aren't bad or good. They're emotions. They're neutral, um, and fear itself is is not a bad thing. It's the capacity to experience that fear in in a at an appropriate time and in appropriate ways. Um, it's built into our DNA that uh, certain biological reactions occur when you feel fear and they're intended to protect you. Um, so I think that uh, when, when we're talking about the emotions that our relationship with, with God elicits, we, we probably ought to view these emotions as neither good nor bad. Um, they simply are. The other thing is most of the times in the Bible, when when you see the the word or the phrase "fear God," um, the wording, and we've talked about this before, is a bit different. It is not to be petrified like you would if you saw a a frightening movie or you see some of the costumes that people wear on this month. Um, but rather, fearing is is to be in awe of something that is wholly other. It's it's very much the same thing that that I experienced a few few weeks ago. We we had the opportunity um, to go out and, and to visit one of one of our national parks here, and it was the sky was beautiful and um, it was just lit up. And I in that moment I realized how insignificant I was. Uh, when, when compared to the Creator, and yet this Creator knew me in a very personal way. So um, fear is it can, can be understood, in, understood better in that context. Now the question then becomes, 
what, um, what, are, what are these emotions, whether it be fear or awe or any other emotion that you may feel with God, what do those push you to do? And it seems like what Deuteronomy is pushing us to is to respond in three primary ways. Um, you, when, when it comes to God, to a God that, that is desperately interested in engaging us in our reality, there are three things that inform this text in Deuteronomy 6. First, it's a culture of crying. Uh, God's story with Israel begins in cries. I have heard the cry of my people in Egypt, and now I am going to do something. Um, the second thing is a culture of care. So um, God not only hears the cry, not only does our relationship with God a lot of times uh, start with a cry, but it almost always uh, develops into, into God's care for us. And then ultimately, uh, and, and thirdly, God allows us to rage, right? Um, sometimes uh, in, in the Bible, we, we see people, particularly in the wisdom literature, that have become so accustomed to God's care that sometimes things don't go right. And in those cases, uh, protesting and, and being angry and asking hard questions of God um, is, is uh, good theology. And the tension is always there between our faith and our ability to question and our desire to cry and God's caring response. In all of this, this milieu of, of emotions, I think, causes us um, to, to fall in love with God. And, and the reason why is, uh, Stu, you know, I, I, my wife and I were talking about this in, uh, earlier this week because uh, we, we're, we're going on 13 years of marriage this month is our anniversary. So we began to think about our history uh, throughout these 13 years. And there's been just so many emotions that we've experienced, crying and raging and caring. And what, what has come out of kind of this emotional journey is a deeper understanding, a deeper connection, and a deeper love. And so I think the relationship between fearing um, God or being in awe of God and any other emotion um, that we, we feel when it comes to God is the way in which our love for God is, is fed. I think that's really helpful. Another aspect that I kind of look at it is when I've always found it helpful when they, like you mentioned, it, the words used there aren't kind of the idea of petrified. Another aspect, though, is it seems as though people that fear God in the negative way, in, in that we think is, you know, perfect love casts out fear, kind of the contrast to that, is that it's it's it has to do with the relationship with God. Even in the description, as we come to the end of the world, you know, Christ is coming and they want the rocks to come out and and bury them. You know, it's the relationship is is one of fear uh, because of not knowing God and kind of being out of harmony. Also, you kind of I've always found, we've mentioned this several times now in the, in the Sabbath school discussion. I still find it very fascinating that Adam and Eve were experiencing fear, what we would perceive as perhaps the negative thing, not because God changed, but because they changed. Mm -hmm. And I think right at the very beginning, there's kind of some messages that God isn't seeking to engage with us in a, in a fearful way, in what we would consider a negative way, but it has to do with that relationship. Another aspect in this lesson, we're kind of talking about how the law fits into the kind of concept of education. And one of the things I got thinking about, and I'd, I'd like to have you respond to this, it seems to me often, at least within the Christian realm, and I don't think it's unique to, to Christianity, there's kind of this focus on qualification, not restoration, mm. especially when it comes to the law. And what I'm basically saying is we think, well, it, it, you know, am I obeying so then I'll make it into heaven and all this kind of stuff? And that doesn't seem to be God's focus. No. It's, it's restoration. And so when it comes to the law, it's more of a, let me explain to you why it's not working. Right. This is what's this, this harmony. Would you resonate kind of with that idea, what, what I'm saying, where we, we seem to focus as humans more on do we qualify mm. 
not on what God's focusing on, which is, I want to restore the relationship. Yeah, that's that's really well stated. Um, this is why I think for me, just reading this lesson and, and pondering and, and then spending some time just uh, trying to understand how uh, the educational development process works um, from a biological and psychological perspective, um, it really struck me, Stu, because my children are going to form these constructs based on the inner dialogue that I have with them. So I am, in essence, as we said before, writing their language. And too often, the language that we write for our kids when it comes to God is one in which um, we are achievement-based, and you mentioned it, right, so that I can qualify, or fear-based. Um, and the law takes on this almost nefarious character when when our religion and our theology is bad theology, and by bad theology, I mean theology based on fear. If you look at any authoritarian government, and there's been a bunch of wonderful uh, studies done on the culture of fear, it is... Uh, there, are, there are governments that install fear through the arbitrary use of law. So law and order is kind of this code word for arbitrary control. That's not what's happening with God. With God, the, the Shema calls you to love him, but it also gives you the capacity to love something else. Now, the reality is, once you love other things, the system begins to break down. And as the system breaks down, you need to have some guardrails in order for it for the whole thing not to become uh, chaotic. So I, I think I've told this story before. Um, but I was in uh, I was in Yellowstone this this past summer, and I was with my my baby, my questioning, precocious Kai. And we've talked about how rambunctious he is. And so um, I had to spend about 10 minutes before we walked onto the geysers pointing to the litany of signs that were all over these geysers that said, do not touch hot. Well, why are those, why was that written there? Why, why did somebody decide we better put a bunch of signs? Do not touch. Uh, do not come close. Do not walk on. It was like this list of things. And it's because somebody at some point touched it, tried to drink the water, or tried to walk on it. And so the more the system breaks down, the more guardrails you need. And so the emergence of laws from one, the law of love, to 10, the Decalogue, to 613, the ones that they had in the New Testament, to um, whatever it is that we have now, these are all responses to the system breaking down. And so I think when, when God becomes the focus, the law is extremely useful to understand what priorities God has. When, when fear becomes the focus, then the law takes this nefarious character that, uh, that really guides inner dialogues that create a lot of shame and guilt. You, what you were saying there kind of reminded me something about how I kind of view the scriptures. You alluded to it earlier in that, you know, there was kind of like one law, and then it's like as we keep drifting farther away, more has to be written down, more guardrails. And fundamentally, that's kind of how I see the scriptures. It, it seems often a new prophet or someone comes along because they've drifted Away, And I, I think there's some really, in, which we don't have time, there's some interesting exploration there of how the sp inspired scriptures can guide us and teach us when you understand that underlying that more is written because we've drifted away. But another aspect, when I think about the qualification regarding restoration, I'm going to use a metaphor, and, and like all metaphors, it's not perfect, but... Stay with me here. It it seems as though the way we kind of tend to look at faith, especially when we emphasize the focus on qualification rather rest, restoration of a relationship, it's like when we're driving our car and we get a flat tire. Now, my particular car doesn't even have this. Uh, we're trying to remedy that. But a lot of the cars went from a regular size tire to this little dinky kind of thing. And every once in a while, you'll see someone cruising down the freeway 
least in LA here, at 80 miles an hour with that little dinky tire. Now, in the perfect sense, or, or the perfectly technical sense, the car has qualified to get back to getting you from point A to point B. And I've seen some, it looks like they've left it that way for a long period of time. Now, I realize some people, their resources, that may be what they can do. So I'm not making any judgment about that. But it's, in actual fact, it's not really restoring the car to its original intent. So it's always vulnerable that it may have another flat because it wasn't really designed to be driven for a long period of time. And, you know, and, and so it's always vulnerable. So when I look at the law and this concept of restoration, if we just focus on qualification, then it kind of leaves the kind of behavior side. And it seems that's, that's where we get into problems is behavior is somehow what qualifies us. And, you know, very early on the lesson, it, it quotes, I think it's Galatians, where it's kind of like, if, if we could find a law that would make us righteous, then that's what we would use. The law just diagnoses what the problem is. It lets us know. It educates us. It, it tells us how it should be. And I think also another problem we run into is we feel these laws are arbitrary. You know, like, oh, well, I just get what I get. I want to do kind of get away with as much as I can, but as long as I qualify, wow. well, God is interested in, in restoring. Well, now I move to the kind of, kind of concept of, of relationships. What I, I talked to my oldest son, who's now married, one of the things, try to encourage him as much as possible when going into a relationship is don't stop dating, don't stop investing. And I think if all of us stopped and really thought about relationships, we're looking for relationships that are not static, but dynamic, and, they, and, and grow and become more meaningful. And I think if, if those of us that are, are married or, or any kind of relationship, but particularly in a marriage relationship, you realize that there's kind of a tendency for things to stop if you're not careful. And when you think about it, that's when things start creating some problems. Mm -hmm. and, and so when we think of the law in relationship to God, and I'd like to see how, how, how you would kind of relate to this concept that basically... So the law kind of gives us a diagnosis of what's not working, but also kind of gives us a, a clarity in, in how it's supposed to work. Right. And, and so then in a relationship sense, God died in the cross, took care of the diagnosis, the disease. But the ideal is God wants us all to be continually experiencing, growing, and changing. Why do you think we s tend to stop, or in our Christian experience, or we look out there, it feels as though many in the church, including ourselves, is not changing. We just stop. Yeah, well, it, it has to do with our inability to be dynamic. And, and what I mean by that is, just think about how you've described the law. And, and I, I love the, the analogy of, of relationships, because I think it's, it's an apropos one. So when you meet someone for the first time and you're going to enter into a relationship, whether it be romantic or platonic, there are all these relational cues, laws, if you will, that are going to ensure that the relationship works out. Uh, in my case, it's never discuss religion, never discuss politics. Um, that's like rule number one, particularly in the times we're living in now. But as you go and as this rela these relationships deepen, um, you begin to not ignore, but you're not aware of the existence of these laws. Um, and, you, and, the, and there becomes there, there begins to uh, occur this openness um, to maybe explore things in a different way. Linda's rule when we started dating was, I'm not going to eat anything that is not cooked. And as we got to know each other, she discovered this thing called sushi, and she still doesn't really understand how that works, but she likes it. She forgot that that law, or at least wasn't, was uh, 
in, is not aware that it, that it's operating, if you will. I think that's what happens. I think we we just des- we decide for some reason to stay at this superficial level with God. And when you're at this very superficial level, the laws matter much more than as you get deeper. Not because the laws cease to be important, but because you cease to be aware that they're there, if that makes any sense. So I think that's why it's so important that in our educational process, and as we look at, at trying to frame the law in a healthy way, as, as we become the inner voices for our children, um, we, we begin to push them not just to follow rules, but to understand principles, because principles are going to give you a clear picture of who God is. The other thing that happens, and I think one of the reasons why we get stuck, is as Brugman said at, our, at the beginning of our time together, um, religious education becomes uh, begins to be seen as privatistic. In other words, it's only for church and spirituality, and spirituality is part of of who I am. It's one of my components. Yeah, that doesn't work. Spirituality is not part of who you are. Spirituality is who you are. You are as much a homo sapiens as a homo as you are a homo religious. You care about spirit. God created you as a spiritual being. And so if we begin to look at what we learn and these ideas, these laws, these principles that we learn from scripture, and we pursue this relationship that that these ideals give us, then we begin to expand. Uh, we can as as the our awareness for the law becomes smaller. Our awareness for the fact that we live as spiritual beings in this world becomes greater. And so here's the here's the incredible thing. Spirituality impacts every single thing you do. Mother Teresa didn't follow any law to go to Calcutta, but that spirituality impacted every single relationship she had and every single way in which she interacted with the world. Well, like we... We've said many times in this conversation, in different contexts of Sabbath school, you know, in a marriage relationship, if it's driven by the law, you really have to question what the meaning of the relationship is. But there are definitely laws. And when I think about when a red light goes and I'm supposed to stop, am I just doing that because it's a law? There, There is kind of a purpose to that, where when you see the big truck going across, and if I hadn't stopped at the red light... That big truck would have been going through my car. Right. There's some basic, basic reasons. And there's so much more we could talk about the, the law. And I, it's something that I know it creates such tension and concern. But I know that God wants us to experience so much more richness in our lives today, in our relationships. And the law plays such a key role and I think as we continue to discuss the, the, the law in on, ongoing lessons, we can see that even more and more. Well, we're out of time, and we're so glad you've joined, so chosen to study with us. Before we close, Pastor Miguel, can you close us with prayer? Sure, let's pray. Master Teacher, you, you push us to look up to the heavens and to ask, where does our help come from? And we recognize that our help comes from the Lord, the one who created the vastness of the universe. We recognize that you are the that you are God and you are one. But then our thoughts turn inward to the hundreds of millions of neurons and the billions of synapses that become who we are. And we recognize, Lord, that sometimes those inner voices, the way in which that information is communicated, focuses on on ideas like fear and restrictions. Today we want to ask that you speak a new voice into our minds, one that operates through love, one that recognizes the importance of law, in our educational process, but law as a tool to guide us to closer connections with you. Today we want to hear the voice, the voice of Jesus. We want that to be the guiding force for our inner dialogue. 
as he says, my grace is sufficient. So that we may answer every question that we have, why we're here and what does it mean to be your followers? By simply saying, we are sons and daughters of the one who loved us first. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.